Okay, welcome to the second uh, lecture in the um, health, Global Public Health Lecture Series. And we're particularly pleased tonight to have with us Dr. Darren Bell. Darren is a clinical assistant professor of medicine with the Family Medicine Residency Program of Western Montana. And that's in the College of Health Professions and Biomedical Sciences here at the University of Montana. He also works part-time as a hospitalist at St. Patrick's Hospital. He has lived and taught in Missoula for the last year and a half. Prior to moving to Montana, he spent eight years living and working in rural and bush communities throughout Alaska. In that capacity, he served as a medical director for a volunteer EMS service, a national park, a nursing home, and a maximum security prison. As you can see, they all had a lot of the same kinds of issues there. He has put together and participated in several overseas medical volunteer trips in Africa and Southeast Asia. During these experiences, experiences he has witnessed the profound effects the physical environment can have on the health of a population and its individuals, as well as the effects that the health of people can have on their environment. Uh, his talk tonight is called The Interplay of Human and Environmental Health Experiences in Borneo. Please join me in welcoming Darren Bell. Thanks. Is the mic good? Okay. Can everybody hear me? Yeah? Okay, good. If anybody has any problems hearing me at any point, uh, just let me know, um, and I can put on a second mic and magnify my voice even more. Um, tonight we're going to spend a few minutes, and I, I just basically want to talk to you about, as Peter mentioned, the, the interaction and the interplay between environmental and human health, okay? If you have any questions at any point throughout the talk, if you want to interject, if you have some profound or not so profound comments, feel free to raise your hand or just butt in. I don't really care. I'm pretty flexible that way. Okay. And then we're going to work our way through and then we'll have some time for questions at the end if anybody has anything that they want to want to know about. Okay. So just to start things off, I found this quote from Hippocrates, who's the father of medicine, as many of you probably are aware. And this is from his essay on airs, waters, and places. Whoever wishes to investigate medicine properly should proceed thus. In the first place, to consider the seasons of the year and the effect, what the effects each of them produces. Then the winds, the hot and the cold. We must also consider the qualities of the waters, for as they differ from one another in taste and weight, so also do they differ much in their qualities. And in the ground, whether it be naked and deficient in water or wooded and well watered, and whether it lies in a hollow, confined situation or is elevated and cold. So this just really illustrates an interesting point. From the very beginnings of Western medicine as we know it, and probably long before that, people have understood that there's a really direct link between the health of people and the environment in which they live. That was known even by Hippocrates. So today we're just going to explore this a little bit. Um, we're going to use Borneo as a case study, uh, kind of as we go through. We're going to talk a little bit about the history of the interactions between humans and their environment and the health perspectives on both. We're going to talk about some problems as the world modernizes and develops, and we're going to talk about problems in the developing world. Um, we're going to talk specifically about some possible solutions that uh, I experienced, along with my wife, who's sitting here in the middle, uh, when we took a trip to, to Borneo. So to start off, I just want to touch base on Borneo. Who knows where Borneo is? Wow. Two people. Three. Okay, good. <laughs> So Borneo is in Southeast Asia, okay? It's right here. It's the third largest island in the world. Second, or right behind Papua New Guinea, and technically if you count Greenland as an island, which some people do and some people don't. So it's either the second or the third largest island in the world. 
Specifically, where we were was right here in the Indonesian portion of Borneo. Borneo consi consists of all or part of three different countries. Indonesia has the largest part. It's actually split into two regions, East and West Kalimantan. And then Malaysia has Sarawak and Sabah as the regions in it, and then extends up farther. And then Brunei, the entire kingdom of Brunei is contained in the, in the island of Borneo. Where we were was in a little tiny village called Sukadana, or a little town rather, to, called Sukadana. It was near a national park called Gunung, Gunung Palung National Park. Most of the pictures that you're going to see throughout this come from this area, another national park right down here called Tanjan Punting, and then a couple of pictures. Some of the pictures will come from actually Papua when we, uh, at the end of our trip, we took some, spent some time trekking through, uh, through Indonesian Papua as well. So when people think of Borneo, if they think of Borneo at all, which most people don't in uh, the United States, we discovered upon our return, we were very impressed that we were there and other people just didn't know what it meant. Um, but they think of biodiversity. There's lots and lots of animal life there, okay? Um, and this is just a couple of examples. You got a hornbill and a kingfisher, wild pigs, crocodiles, um, lots and lots of things. But people, what they, when they, if they know about Borneo, what they really think about are the monkeys, okay? These are macaques, gibbons, and proboscis monkeys, which are all over the place, particularly the macaques. They get into everything. They're like squirrels are here on campus. They're just everywhere you go and really, really annoying pests. But does anybody know what the classic, technically it's not a monkey, it's an ape, but the classic monkey or ape that people associate with Borneo? I thought I heard somebody say it. There you go, the orangutan. So orangutan, orangutan, however you want to say it, the one thing that I will suggest is that if you're talking to somebody who deals with orangutans, don't put a G on the end of the word. There's no G, it's not orangutan, but that gets said a lot. This comes, the name orangutan actually comes from Indonesian. The word orang means person, the word hutan means forest. And so you put them together, you've got orangutan. They're the forest people, and the natives in the area, they look, they behave in many ways, just like people do, and so that's kind of where they got their, their name from. Most of the pictures of the orangutans that I have in here come from that Tanjan Puting National Park down on the south, southern coast of, of Borneo. This is an area that's actually an orangutan preserve um, because of problems with deforestation and loss of habitat for the orangutans. Um, they have some very isolated pockets where orangutans still survive. There are some in Gunung Palung National Park where we were. However, we weren't actually allowed into the park. Because of some corruption issues with the park, they said the only way we're allowing anybody who's not Indonesian into the park is if you pay us hmm, somewhere between three and 500 US dollars to get into the park for a day. Whereas we could go to Tanjung Puding National Park and we could spend three days on the river and it's a uh, somewhere around the equivalent of a $25 entrance fee. So that's why a lot of these pictures come from there. They have signs like this because the orangutans, since it's a orangutan preserve and they bring in orangutans to rehabilitate them and try and get them re-acclimatized to wild environments when they take them from people's homes, the orangutans are very habituated to people. They get really close, okay? Really close. And when you look at an orangutan like this, this is a young male orangutan. They told us at the time that female orangutans are about eight times stronger than the average human being, the average male human, adult male human being. So when you're posing for a picture like this, if you happen to be traveling with your brother who is studying monkeys in Borneo, and he stands behind you and goes, <coughs> which is an orangutan distress symbol or signal, you are very, very glad that those long arms are just beyond your reach when the orangutan turns around and takes a swing at you. It's a very intimidating situation to be in. They also get into situations like this, which is the other reason for the sign. This is the guide who took us up the river for the, the three days that we were there. And this is an old persnickety male. Um, the guy got up and ran away, fortunately, before he actually got a hold of his backpack. But then this uh, orangutan proceeded to try and jump onto our boat to get at the food that was in there as well. So, like I said, we were in a different national park, which you can see behind the building here. This is Gunung Palung National Park, and we were working in a village just outside. We were working for an, or, an organization called Clinic ASRI, which stands for, ASRI is an acronym for Alam Sehat Lestari, which you can see in blue right there. Uh, and they have a sister organization in the United States called Health in Harmony, okay? The, 
Clinic ASRI Alam Sahat Lestari was set up in Indonesia by an American doctor and an Indonesian dentist. Health and Harmony was a sister organization that was set up as a nonprofit in the United States to support this clinic with the idea that if the program then expands into other areas, then this organization would be set up in the West to, to help fund and uh, resource those, those expansion projects. Um, I'm going to talk a lot more about, about what they do there here in just a bit, but before I get into that, I wanted to touch base on just a little bit of a historical perspective about how humans and their environment have interacted and how it's affected their health over the course of the millennia. Okay, um, This was interesting, this map, I don't know when this map was from, but it was really interesting to me to see that the spice trade all along the coast of southern Asia, Africa, and up to Europe is very, very well delineated. But whenever this was made, apparently Australia kind of faded into nothing, as did North America, and Antarctica just didn't exist whatsoever. So looking back, hunter-gatherers. When we were hunter-gatherers as a people, there was an obvious interplay between environmental health and human health. Okay? At this point in human history, your health was completely and totally dependent on your, upon your environment. Okay, there are three basic things that you need for survival. Anybody know what they are? Shelter, food, and water. Absolutely. Those are the primary three things. And if you don't have those things, all of your health depends on that. As a hunter-gatherer type people, that's basically what you're primarily looking for. You've got to have something to protect you from the elements. You've got to have a source of water. You've got to have food. Okay? These can be obviously problematic because when the environment sends you inclement weather or when it, it provides droughts and you're not able to get food or the animals don't migrate like they're supposed to or the water sources all dry up, then you have significant health problems. Malnutrition um, leading to all of the complications associated that, with that on down to eventual death if you're not able to fix the situation. Then as we move through history, people develop agriculture. Agriculture makes a huge difference in terms of their health and the way, they interact, the way people interact with their environment. Okay? Agriculture, once you're able to grow things, once you're able to provide your own food, you take away one of the major stressors on your health and life in general. You have a steady supply of food. Usually you're going to be located near a water source. You no longer have to worry about dying of dehydration. And with agriculture, it also allows you to build settlements and to form more permanent structures. Okay? Um, along with agriculture, however, um, are some concerns that go along with it. Okay? When we were hunter-gatherers, we were a part of the ecosystem. We were a part of the environment. We were basically apex predators. The ecosystem and the environment would compensate for anything that you did. Once you start to settle and develop agriculture, then you're all of a sudden modifying the environment in significant ways, which make it more difficult for the environment to recover or compensate. People tend to grow the crops that they like to eat. So they grow monocultures, monocrops. They raise animals that are useful to humans. They try and fence off, or in the case here, put rock walls to, to separate this from the wild environment. That starts to lead to stresses within the environment. While it helps reduce stresses on humans and human health, it leads to stresses in the environment and environmental health. Along with that, like I said, you get structures that can be built. Structures generally start out fairly rudimentary. These were uh, mud huts, and the, or I'm sorry, uh, grass huts, and these were in, uh, in Papua. Um, but with these, you all of a sudden are able to get away from the wind. You're able to get away from the rain. Not so much snow all that often um, when you're right along the equator, although in the highlands it does get a little bit cold uh, at times. But you can get away from the elements. But at the same time, construction is a bit of a problem because when you've got a hut that's made of grass, there are lots and lots of nooks and crannies in which things can live, including insects, including rats, including various vectors of disease. And so while, again, taking off the stresses from the stage before, it can lead to increased stresses and increased health problems because of additional problems associated with it. Once you've got settlements and once you've got agriculture, it can lead to increased population density. You have people with a water source, you have people with a food source. People can then expand and they can grow. This leads to its own set of problems. With more people, you get more environmental effects. You requires more land. And as you can see here, looking on this picture, 
This whole hillside all over here is basically completely devoid of trees. This used to be a rainforest. Okay? Now it's completely devoid of trees because people have had to come in and they've had to cut down all of the trees, both for construction of the frames of their huts, but also to allow them to have arable land that they can grow crops on. With increased population density, you also have increased risk of passing diseases to one another. When you have crowded environments inside huts with large families and large hut, uh, lots of huts in close proximity and everybody working in, in close proximity with one another, they pass diseases back and forth. If you have a rat living in this hut that's defecating and, uh, and leaving all sorts of infectious vector or all sorts of infectious material in this hut, there's nothing to stop it from running the 20 yards to this hut and doing the same thing in the next one. So you get expanding problems with expanding population as well, both for the human health and for the environmental health. At the same time, you get the advent of a new problem that goes along with this, is the more people you have around, the more waste you have to deal with. So at first, when it's just a small group of people that's always moving, okay, well, you chop up whatever food source you have, the pieces that you don't need or the construction material that you don't need, you toss them to the side and they move along. Most of that stuff is natural, natural from the local environment and it will eventually break down and it's in small quantities. But when you've got a permanent settlement and an expanding settlement, then all of a sudden you have a lot more concentrated waste in one area. Both waste of materials but also human waste. This in turn then can wash down into rivers and contaminate your water sources and can get into your food supply which can cause obvious health problems along those lines as well. Then moving on, we get more industrialization and modernization. Okay, so while looking at this, this, and this by the way was uh, the view out of our front door of, our, of the place we were staying at in, in Sugadana, you get better protection from the environment. Okay, you also start to develop resources like being able to bring in water from an outside area so that you can have a more steady supply. At the same time, however, Lots and lots of problems, as we're all aware, have gone into the process of development, modernization, and industrialization. The construction materials, these houses are great as long as you're not chewing on the lead paint chips. You know, the, the piped water supply, there's lead in the water pipes. I don't know that there was any asbestos around at this point, but obviously in certain areas that's been a big problem. It's a fire retardant, which then can cause all sorts of respiratory issues associated with it. So construction materials and what's available can lead to all sorts of problems as well. In addition, to build a steel and concrete bridge requires a lot of mining, it requires a lot of industry to produce those raw materials. So all of a sudden this river here is no longer having to deal with just the wastes from the humans living on it, but it also has to deal with the industrial wastes. And then you start ending up with all sorts of chemicals and other toxic pollutants into your water stream, into your food supply potentially, that can lead to ongoing human health problems. So it's a mixed bag as you, as you go up the chain of development throughout the history of the world. And finally, we make it to modern cities, okay? This one's San Francisco. This is where we departed from on our trip uh, over to Borneo, and this is the one we landed in. This is Singapore, and for any of you who have never traveled to Southeast Asia, I would highly recommend Singapore as an initial exposure. It's kind of like Southeast Asia light. You still have to, you know, watch what you're drinking and that sort of stuff, but you got all the modern amenities that you're used to, so it's kind of nice, a nice little introduction there. But when you're talking about big cities, then everything is just magnified, right? Because all of a sudden you've got a lot of raw material that goes into this, a lot of resources that have to be exploited, and a lot of potential problems in the process of taking advantage of those resources to build things like this. In addition, you've got a lot of people. That's a lot of waste you've got to get rid of. Okay. However, usually when you have modernization, you have what we think of as big developed cities and big developed areas, they usually come, on, uh, come along with improved governmental structures. So you start to have oversight in terms of things. You have oversight and regulations, monitoring water quality. It's why you can drink from the tap and anywhere you go essentially in the United States, not so in other countries. It's why you can generally count on your lakes and rivers not being extremely polluted by raw sewage being poured into them. Not the case in other areas of the world, even in some big cities. But these sorts of things start to come into effect. This has an interesting effect in that while you get more regulation in developed areas, a lot of these problems sometimes will get shunted to developing areas, and so you end up magnifying problems in areas that aren't so developed as well, and we'll talk about that here a little bit more uh, in just a bit. In addition, as all of us are aware, 
When you have lots of people, you have modern conveniences, modern transportation, you have things like smog and air pollution that go along, which lead to increased rates of asthma and respiratory problems. You have things like contamination of, of other environmental, environmental toxins, such as the lead like we talked about previously, where still, if you walk around Missoula or anywhere else, particularly if you're walking around the university district, most of those houses there still have lead paint on them. Okay? So it's still out there, it's still in the environment, and it still has the potential to cause the neurotoxicity in small children if they're chewing on the lead paint chips that, that are ubiquitous, even now in our environment, much less in other environments like Singapore, where the regulations aren't as stringent and things haven't quite caught up. And then we come to what I like to refer to as apex development, as far as we're concerned right now. Where is this? Disneyland, yeah, if there's one place that people think of anywhere in the world as being clean and friendly and just a super place to be, it would be Disneyland because they've got armies of people picking up all the trash. If you've ever walked down Main Street in Disneyland, there are people all over the place picking up trash, taking things away. They've got people cleaning bathrooms. They've got people just taking care of everything so it all looks pristine. So you would think if there was anything that modern society could produce that would be a healthy, wonderful environment for us to be in, you'd think Disneyland. However, as we all know from the last several weeks' news, it comes with its own problems, okay? You get a whole bunch of people in any one location and all of a sudden it's really easy to pass diseases back and forth to one another, okay? You have one person with measles and there are enough people out there who aren't immunized against measles that all of a sudden we've got an outbreak and it spreads to multiple states. I think it's up to, what, seven or eight states now that we've got outbreaks of measles in all based on one exposure in Disneyland, okay? So this is just put in here to illustrate the point that it doesn't matter what we do. There's going to be good and bad in terms of our development. And we've got to continuously be observant. We're going to continuously have to deal with the interplay with our environment and us as a people in terms of how do we best provide for our health and our health care. Let's go back and talk a little bit about the developing world. Okay, I want to touch base on this because the developing world is kind of at an interesting crossroads. It's not the same as historically when people were first settling down and building up and modernizing and industrializing, because at that point, most of the world was going through the same process at the same time. The developing world has this weird kind of in-between status, okay? You've got people who are living in shacks with their trash out in front, you know, with the big holes between the walls, no windows on them. Um, but at the same time, in between these shacks with no windows, you've got a satellite dish for your television inside. It's also kind of interesting that in, uh, in Indonesia, or along the equator anywhere, all the satellite dishes point straight up, as opposed to all of them pointing south in, in the northern hemisphere, which I didn't even realize until we went there. And I was like, why are all those things pointing straight up? That's where the satellites are. That's just a little aside. Um, so you've got some of these modern conveniences and some of the issues that go along with them, but you don't have a lot of the benefits, improved construction, improved access to water. Places like this don't have running water. Places like this don't even have outhouses. They don't have anywhere to go to the bathroom. Okay, and I'll show you a place where we did, uh, went uh, for a mobile clinic here in just a bit that we got done. We'd been there for six hours during the day. And at the end of the day, I'm like, well, I'll go to the bathroom. They're like, yep, bush right over there. And I'm glad, huh, I, I think, huh. I'm really glad I only have to do certain things out there as opposed to others because it's a real problem for people, okay? And when you're dealing with that, you've got all sorts, of, all sorts of problems that go along with that. You've got a lot of people living in these places, a lot of people spreading their waste all over the place, which has the potential to contaminate their water supply because it's all local and they don't have any piped in water anywhere, okay? You do get some of the conveniences and some of the problems associated with mass transportation as well. People can get around. They've all got motorbikes. They can get around. They can pass diseases from one another. This became really apparent um, looking at the, the Ebola outbreak in Africa. Okay? It's thought that Ebola has been around for at least a century, but nobody ever really heard about it until the 60s because it didn't really make it out of a village. If someone got Ebola, an Ebola infection in, a, in an African village, they never left. 
And so it would be very localized and very isolated to that one location. But when everybody's got motorbikes or there are buses or there are trains that people can get around, then all of a sudden they have the ability to tra transport whatever problems, whatever diseases, to a much larger group of people and it has the ability to spread quite a bit. It's also interesting because you have things like this, which uh, look like mm, nice new modern high-rise apartment buildings that are going in. Yeah, no, these are actually birdhouses. These are for swallows or swifts, which they're constructing so that they'll come in and build their birds' nests that they then ship to China because it sells for a lot of money for birds' nest soup. So they build much fancier buildings, if you have the money, for their birds to live in than a lot of the people are living in in the same area. And this is not unique to Indonesia. It's not unique to Borneo. This sort of thing happens all over the place. Along with the modern conveniences, you get things like this. This is the Indonesian version of the container store. Comes around the neighborhood once a week with all of the plastic stuff that you could possibly want on it. You flag it down and it stops and you buy your little buckets or pails. They're all incredibly cheap. They're all incredibly poorly made. And when you're done with them, there's no centralized garbage collection, so you just throw them outside. And either they sit and they slowly break down in the environment around there, or you burn them. And that's the way you clean up your yard. And if you burn them, then obviously it re releases all of the toxins and all of the issues that are contained within the plastic into the atmosphere, leading to respiratory problems and other things along those lines. You're also still slightly further removed from your food source, but you don't have the regulations that help to ensure that your food quality is good, okay? In some cases, you're actually fairly local. These are villagers who have hiked, some of these people have hiked up to five days with their, their harvest to come to this market, which is the closest market on the road system, to sell what they've got to other people in the city. So you can go and buy, this is the equivalent of, a, of an Indonesian farmer's market, I guess. Um, but you also have situations like this, where who knows how long these eggs have been sitting here. I guarantee there's no one inspecting them. You know, this scale that we got all of our coffee weighed on that we, we purchased from this place, who knows what they'd set on it just before to weigh it, you know? Uh, you kind of hope, cross your fingers and hope that nothing goes on. You can buy all of your other modern conveniences and plastic stuff here as well. And then sometimes you might look out your front door and see a goat transaction taking place in your front yard, which is still pretty local and pretty direct as they bundle it up and stick it on the back of their motorbike to ride away. But along with this, it's an interesting situation in that people have awareness of but they don't necessarily have access to modern medicine, okay? So the things that we do here to take care of a lot of these problems that go along with development, they have heard about, but they don't have access to them. This was taken in an airport in Raja Ampat, um, which is just off the uh, coast of, of Papua, of Indonesian Papua. And I thought this was great because this is an AED, an automatic external defibrillator, okay? This is set up for someone to have a heart attack in their airport. It's a sign of their modern advancement. It is completely empty. And we saw these things all over the place. You have these great stands and these grand ideas, but you just don't have the access. The equipment isn't there. It stopped working or somebody didn't know how to use it. Or um, on one of our other trips when I was in Ethiopia uh, working in an emergency room, they had two AEDs in a box in a storeroom in the back room and nothing to, uh, to actually resuscitate people in the emergency department. So there are lots and lots of, of little ways in which the problems associated with the developed world kind of get magnified when you're talking about the developing world. I mentioned earlier some of the problems being shunted, okay? What happens when mining gets shut down here? What happens when mining gets shut down in other developed countries or drilling for oil or production of, of automobiles because of expense? They get shifted over to areas where things aren't as expensive and or where regulations aren't as tight. And so a lot of the problems that we're trying to combat with pollution and issues for us in the developed world, they don't have the option because they say it's jobs and it's the only thing we have available. And so it gets shunted because we still, everybody still wants the same materials, okay? So this is just an example of how, how things can be problematic. I wanted to talk a little bit now about the ways that the environment affects human health, okay? Um, there are three basic categories in which the environment affects human health. One is direct effects, another is environmental mediated effects, and thirdly is indirect effects of the environment, okay? So when we're talking about direct effects, this is the sort of thing that we're talking about. If you're living in a hut with rough wooden slats for the walls and a thatched roof, and this is your cook fire, 
where is the smoke going whenever you cook this? Where you would think there would be a chimney, they've got a drying rack for more wood, okay? So this smoke goes up and it just completely fills this hut. When it fills the hut, there are extremely high rates of respiratory illnesses in some of these developing areas, okay? You get kids who are exposed day in and day out to just the smoke from cook fires, which if they're lucky, it's smoke from wood, but it could be smoke from animal dung, it could be smoke from any variety of other things that they can find that might be flammable. And so rates of asthma, rates of respiratory illness are just ridiculously high. On a grander scale, while it may make for nice sunrises looking over the forest, lots of smoke, lots of pollutants in the air lead to smog, okay? It's a big problem in, in major developed cities, particularly in, world, in developing world. It's not as bad as it used to be here, although if you go to LA, if you go to Houston, it still can be a real big problem at times. But even in rural environments, you can get some pretty significant um, issues associated with smog. And this is both from industry, this is also from fires and from deforestation, which we're going to talk about a little bit more here in a bit too. But at the same time, other direct effects would be things like droughts um, and heat waves, which will directly kill people off. Floods, which may take out your entire village, or landslides, which the whole hillside can come down. Um, I, don't ha I, I have a picture, I didn't put it in here, but there are two villages on the side of a hill and a gigantic landslide in between the two of them, which, I mean, had that been shifted one way or the other, could have taken out either of those villages. Or perhaps it did take out a village and, one of, and those two popped up on either side of it after it had come through. Then you have environmental mediated effects, okay? And this is a slightly more, more complicated structure or thought structure to, to, to put together. This is where the environment is not directly responsible for you developing asthma because you're breathing in smoke, not directly responsible for you, be, for you being killed because you drown in a flood, but this is where the environment gives rise to the problems, okay? So this would be things like crop failures. If you have a drought period and your crops fail and then you die or get really sick because of malnutrition, because you don't have anything around for you. This would be things like um, when you deforest an area, you cut down the rainforest and turn it to something like this, all of a sudden you have all of these pools of standing water. What grows in standing water? Mosquitoes, vectors of disease. Mosquitoes carry dengue fever, mosquitoes carry malaria. So the, course, the cases of malaria, the cases of infectious diseases, vectors for infectious diseases goes up and the diseases themselves go up as well. And then you have the indirect effects associated with the environment, okay? This was a group of, of guys that when we were trekking, we passed on the trail and they were just sitting around doing nothing, carrying their high-powered weapons. Um, joblessness. If you use up all the resources in an area, you don't have any means to take care of yourself. You don't have any food still around. Uh, you don't have any trees left to cut down, nothing to construct. Then you have nothing to do, okay? You have no means to support yourself and support your family. Then you start to develop health problems associated with not having the means to support yourself. And part of this also comes into play in terms of access to developed things. When you need the plastic buckets to carry your water, but you don't have means to pay for them, how are you going to get your water that in a clean, safe manner? How are you going to be able to take care of the family? Conflict zones. Displacement of people, okay? When resources are limited, people start fighting over them. Setting up wars, this happens all over the developed world. And then there are large displacements of people who end up in refugee camps without any resources or much of anything to take care of them, either medical-wise or food and water-wise. Okay? These are the indirect effects that the environment can play in terms of people's health. This is interesting, and I'm going to pull up my notes here because I want to make sure I got the numbers right. So the WHO in 2006 attributed one quarter of all deaths worldwide annually to modifiable environmental factors. They attributed one third, more than one third, of all pediatric deaths annually to modifiable environmental factors. 88% of all diarrheal illnesses, 42% of all cases of malaria, and 95% of all cases of dengue hemorrhagic fever were directly attributable to environmental factors that could be adjusted, could be modified to prevent those illnesses and deaths. That's a really startling statistic when you think about it. A quarter of everybody who dies in the world 
can be directly traced back to something wrong with our environment. That just kind of really pinpoints the issue that we're talking about here. This is not just a local issue dealing with a small group of people who are living in the developing world. This is not just, oh, an occasional kid gets asthma because they're exposed to smog, okay? This is a real global epidemic, okay? This is a, a significant public health problem that we ought to be thinking about. So I want to show just one case example of how, what it is that we're talking about here, okay? This is a picture of Borneo and the forests versus deforestation over the course of time. Everything green is forest, everything yellow is areas that have been cut down. You can see in 1950, the vast majority of the island was rainforest, okay? And we're talking about a huge island, the third largest in the world. We were there in 2011, so it looked about like this. And you can see well over half of all of the forests have been chopped down, probably only about a third left at that point in time. And in, by 2020, it's predicted to be mm, somewhere close to a quarter of the forests are left, okay? Interestingly, we were located right here. I'm sorry, right here is where we were, which if you look, that's Gunung Palung National Park, that little bit of green, which is still predicted to get quite a bit smaller. Now, theoretically, Nobody should be cutting down forests in that park anymore because it's a national park and it's protected. This is one of the big issues that, that Health and Harmony and Clinic Asri are trying to address, which we're going to talk about here. Also, interestingly of note, this is Tanjung Puting National Park where the orangutan preserve is, this little strip of green right here too. And you can see it's already isolated, but it's going to be really isolated. We're not going to have any more habitat. So, so what are we talking about when we're talking about deforestation? Okay. It's basically taking an environment that looks like this, lots of old growth hardwood trees, and turning it into something that looks like this, okay? Nothing left. Why would we do this? Any ideas, any thoughts? What are the causes behind some of this? That would be one. That would be a huge cause. People need to grow food, and so how do they do that? Slash and burn, okay? And we're gonna talk a little bit more detail about that here in just a minute. What else? Used for fuel. Used for fuel and construction materials at the same time. So you burn the wood and you, uh, you build your homes out of it. Export. Export. This is huge, okay? Export of the wood. So I never got an actual number, but one of the thoughts that's particularly in the area that we're talking about, why people continue to illegally cut down trees, is because it's one of their only sources of income. You can cut down a tree, you can float it down a river, and you can sell it. Where does it go? It mostly goes to China to be turned into plywood to be shipped to other areas in the Western world, okay? So a lot of the plywood that's in our homes may very well come from these rainforests in Borneo. I wanted to just point this out. This is a piece of ironwood, okay? This is one of the hardwoods that's found in Borneo. They say, and I haven't looked online to verify this, that this is the densest wood in the world. This piece right here probably weighs mm, maybe five pounds, three to five pounds like this. And y'all can come up and take a look at it afterward if you want, but it's ex ex extremely hard, extremely dense, extremely heavy, very rot resistant, very fire resistant as well. These things get cut down they get shaved into plies and put into plywood in China and shipped off as regular low quality, low, low cost construction materials all over, all over the rest of the world, okay? We're gonna talk about some of the effects of that here in just a bit. This is another big reason why people cut down the trees. Anybody know what those are? Oil palms. Oil palms, exactly. It's so we can have all of our processed foods that are made with palm oil here in the United States. Palm oil plantations are a huge source of income for a very, very limited number of people in throughout Southeast Asia, but in Borneo in particular. Big corporations come in, cut down huge swaths of the land, and then plant oil palm trees, make wild amounts of money for a short period of time, and then the land's used up, and the, the plantations die, and then there are problems with reforestation, which we're gonna talk about here in just a bit, too. This is the other big reason, which was mentioned by you guys, okay? It's locals, all right? These people have been walking for, I think at this point they've been walking for two days from the nearest town on a road system. And some of them were gonna be walking for another two to three days to get back to their villages. About 50% of the people we saw 
we're carrying these things. What is that? Anybody know? Uh, no, it's not water. It's gas. Everybody was carrying jugs of gas, and a lot of people would have two, three, or four of them that they were carrying back with them. If you live two to four days from the nearest road system, what are you using gas for? What's that? Fire? No. Chainsaw. Chainsaw is the biggest one. Some people have generators, but not many. But chainsaws are the biggest one because you need to get at your construction materials. You need to get at your fuel source. You need to be able to do this. What's that? Slash and burn farming. Exactly. This picture, unfortunately, doesn't illustrate it really well, but this entire hillside is completely decimated. No old growth trees on it whatsoever. You can see over here that this has been completely decimated. These areas where it's really steep, there are still trees growing on it, but even here, they're starting to move in. That's a cleared spot. That's a big cleared patch. That's a big cleared patch. They'll cut down all the trees. They'll plant their farms. They'll work the land for a few years until all the value of the soil is used up. And then they move on and slash down another part, burn it up so that they can have more, more land to grow their food on. Okay? This is going back to the basic things that we're talking about in terms of health. You've got to have food. You've got to be able to live. You've got to have construction materials so that you can keep yourself away from the elements so that you're able to survive. These are basic health things, and this is just what people have to use. Now, of course, when they're doing it with chainsaws as opposed to hand saws, they're using fossil fuels and they're causing all sorts of environmental, other environmental issues, which we're not going to spend a whole lot of time dealing with right now. What are the problems associated with deforestation? Why should we care? What does it matter? Biodiversity. Well, that's a huge one, okay? There are two big things from an environmental perspective, or there are actually a lot more, but two things that I want to touch on right now. One is loss of habitat, okay? I showed you the picture of the orangutan preserve and how much it had changed. And I'll show you again here in just a second. Okay? These guys are running out of places to live. All right? And it's not just orangutans. It's all sorts of other animals, which it's nice to show the pictures of the charismatic megafauna that, uh, that really people like to look at and really wrap their arms around. But like you mentioned, the biodiversity. It's these sorts of things. I don't know what most of these things are. They were just interesting growths in the, in the rainforest that we, we took pictures of. But insects. Fungi, plants, probably fungi, and maybe insects or fungi creating those? I don't know. But who knows what these things are? Lots of these things are being used by native people for medicines. If they're not able to grow around there, they don't have local remedies and local ways to take care of their health personally. But lots of them also have the potential for medicines and for things that could directly impact our health down the road. If we don't know what they are, we don't know what we've lost, which is going to be one of the big problems. Because when we're looking for things to treat cancers and to treat, to treat other disease processes that are very difficult to currently manage, having some of these available would be very, very useful in many cases. Okay, again, here's this picture talking about the habitat loss. Okay, if orangutans could survive, used all of this land to survive in for millennia, and now they're reduced to little pockets like this and this, that's obviously going to be a huge stressor on an orangutan. An orangutan who can travel 20 to 30 miles a day, okay? They're always in search of food. They're rebuilding their nests every night to sleep in. They don't stay where they're supposed to stay, according to us. But if all of a sudden they have no way to get anywhere, then that's going to be a real problem, and it's going to put huge stressors on them, okay? Um, the other big issue is when you're losing that much forest, is what does that do to other aspects of your environment? If you have a rainforest that looks like this, a nice river running through it with trees all along the sides, those trees actually play a really important role in the water cycle and the water supply in that area, which again, as we talked about before, directly impacts us. The trees send down roots all throughout the soil. They break up the soil. They tear it apart. Water can then percolate down in, and then it sits in the soil kind of like a sponge, okay? This is great because, A, in the rainy season, the water all soaks into the soil, and it doesn't just wash the soil away, causing floods and landslides and other problems. But in the dry season, too, the water slowly leaches back out. So you have a more continuous water supply, which even in tropical rainforests is a problem, okay? They do have wet seasons and dry seasons. And if you don't have that water coming back out of the ground to nourish the plants, nourish the animals, nourish the people, 
during the dry season, you end up with horrific droughts and problems associated with it because it all rushed right into the rivers and went out to the ocean. Again, like we mentioned, the other issue is if you don't have anything allowing the water to soak into the ground, you end up with pools of standing water. You end up with areas that can be vectors for that can grow vectors for disease, insects, mosquitoes, and other issues. So, I'm just going to spend a few minutes here talking about what can be done, and this is one aspect of what can be done. Health and Harmony and Clinic Asri, or Alam Sehat Lestari, they were set up to address two problems. They wanted to address both the environmental health and the human health of the area in Borneo, of this particular area around this particular national park. Specifically, they were interested in deforestation and the problem with illegal logging that's still going on in the national park, which is why that spot's predicted to get smaller, even though it's supposed to be protected on those maps that I showed you earlier. So how did they go about doing this? Well, it was actually really creative. They went in and they said, okay, we've got a doctor, we've got a dentist. We're going to go talk with these villagers and we're going to see what are the things that they need. What can we do from them? We don't presume to believe that we have the best, the, the right idea, the best thing to do for people. Okay? We want to see what they need and then we want to see if we can help provide those things in exchange for them doing things that are going to both better the environment but better themselves overall down the road because of all of these interactions that we just talked about. And so what did they find out when they talked with people? Well, A, healthcare. They don't have access to healthcare, so they needed healthcare. That would be one big thing that they needed. They also needed alternative forms of livelihood because if your only means of make, having an income is to go out and cut down a tree, you need to have something else that you can do so that you're not tempted to go out and cut down trees. So they said, okay, let's approach it from that, that perspective, from those two perspectives. This is the clinic they set up. Oh, that looks kind of really dark. I apologize about that. This is the clinic they set up. They bought a house in this village, and they set up a little clinic here. It's the only clinic within two hours of the area by motorbike over very, very poor roads. Um, and they bring in uh, local doctors. So every Indonesian physician that goes through medical school there has to go through a year of government service, so a training year, before they can go out and go on and specialize in whatever they want to do and go into private practice and that sort of thing. So um, ASRI set up a contract with the local government here that this could be a training site for those physicians. So the physicians can come in, do their year of training, and then go on and do, and go on and move out and do whatever they want to do. And the hope was that A, they'll have a continuous supply of doctors coming through, and B, that they'll help provide um, health care for the locals even afterward. If some people get interested in that sort of, sort of care and being in rural areas, they might get some people to stick around to go to other, other rural areas like that. At the same time, how do they attract those doctors here to training sites? The training sites are notoriously poor. They're not really training. They're basically slave labor sites. You go to the local health clinic and the doc's just swamped and not able to do anything, okay, because they've got so many people that they have to see. So here they said, well, what we're going to do is we're going to bring in foreign docs on a rotating basis, and we're going to have people come through who will help supervise and train you. So not only are you doing your obligatory service, but you're also getting more education as you go along. And so they have a rotating course of, of, of foreign physicians who come through um, on a regular basis. And almost year-round, they've got at least one foreign physician there who's working with the docs who are training. This is the clinic that they have. Um, very, very rudimentary things. This is the one exam room, the one exam bed, and I can see it on this screen, but you can't see it right here. It's interesting, it's got a little cholera vent here. You can hang a bucket underneath if someone's got cholera and you, they don't even have to get up. Kind of disgusting when you think about it. It is vinyl and you hope there aren't a whole lot of holes in the mattress. It's also only about three feet off the ground, with it, which if you happen to be a six foot tall physician working with five foot tall Indonesian physicians, whenever you're removing lumps and bumps, sewing up, injuries and that sort of stuff. I spent a lot of time kneeling on that hardwood floor, which is really uncomfortable on the knees. With these very limited basic facilities, they deal with a lot of stuff. Everything from routine well child care. This is their baby scale. They hang it from a rope from a beam in the ceiling and then have a balance beam on the side of it, which is kind of cool. 
to significant trauma. This is a guy who fell off his motorbike and broke his leg a year and a half previously, had not been able to bend his knee because his, his uh, tibia was shifted like that and had healed back in place like this, so he was completely unable to bend his knee. Only reason that, that he came in was because now he was getting a pressure ulcer on the back of his leg because the bone was poking from the inside and putting too much pressure on the skin, so he's getting skin breakdown. This patient here, her eyes aren't looking in the same direction because she had meningitis from tuberculosis, which, interestingly enough, is one of the few things that they can diagnose with some accuracy in their laboratory. They have a microscope, and you can see the little tuberculous, the, the bacilli right here, here, this little thing here and here. They can do stains and actually diagnose tuberculosis, which it places here. It takes, in some places, I've worked in hospitals where it takes three days before you can get a test back for tuberculosis in the United States, but they can do it within a matter of about 20, 30 minutes in their, in their clinic. And then this guy was really interesting. I had never seen this before. This guy's got all sorts of hypopigmented areas on his back and on his front, and he's got these really thick cords running down his neck and some in his arms as well. Any idea what this is? We never see it in the United States anymore. Leprosy. Leprosy. It's still a common occurrence. Um, I probably saw in the, in the month that I was volunteering there, I probably saw maybe once a week a case of leprosy come into the clinic. So. The really interesting thing that they do, though, is they, they have a graduated payment plan that they really use as an incentive to help stop the deforestation. They allow people to pay. They have set prices. If you live in a village that has agreed, all of the adults in the village have agreed to no longer engage in illegal logging, those prices drop. Okay? They also don't deny care to anybody and let you pay with whatever you have. These hats were payment. People wo wove hats, they wove baskets, they made all sorts of little trinkets that then the, the, then the clinic would sell in a little gift shop in the lobby um, to, to make the money back. They would let you pay with manure, they would let you pay with eggshells, they would let you pay with time worked either in the clinic or in several of their outreach programs. Lots and lots of available ways to pay for things, which is great because the hospital two hours down the road, if you didn't have cash up front, you were not admitted to the hospital which is a big problem. I transferred one patient to the hospital from our clinic. The patient came back and actually, unfortunately, died a couple of days later because the family couldn't afford to, uh, to put them in the hospital because um, they demanded payment up front. This is the clinic. This is the lobby of the clinic, but this is also illustrating a really interesting thing. Again, for villages that everybody agrees to not engage in, in illegal logging, they set up mobile clinics. We pack up all of this gear into a four-wheel drive vehicle like this with our professional driver who does nothing but drive vehicles for Clinic Astri, and we pack it all up and we head out to villages, which this is why we have a professional driver. You start out in the city on a nice modern bridge like that. As you get farther and farther away, the bridges get less and less developed until they become downright problematic and essentially end up non-existent before you get to some of these areas. You can spend six to eight hours driving as little as 20 miles to get to some of these villages, which becomes a huge problem because when you get to a village like this and you find the headman's house and you go in and you set up shop, you unpack all of your gear, you end up with cats wandering through, but you also end up with patients. Lots and lots of patients come through and you do what you can with what you've got in those facilities. This picture I particularly like because my wife was uh, um, the first physical therapist that they'd ever had work at this clinic. And so people had no idea. All these people were coming in with low back pain and people had no idea what to do with his low back pain. So she made up all sorts of handouts and instructed both the doctors and the nurses on, on some basic simple stretches and exercises for low back pain. And this is one of the doctors, same one as up here. Dr. Ruth, by the way, who was really distraught to learn that she shared her name with someone else. Um, <laughs> But she was teaching a patient here with low back pain just some simple, some simple stretching exercises which were just huge to people. It's amazing what stretches, exercises, and Tylenol can do for people when they don't have anything else. But when you don't have access to care because of roads like this, you don't get things checked out. Okay, this was a gentleman that we saw that unfortunately he had no means to get into a clinic whatsoever. This had been growing on his foot for about six months. Okay, when, when it was initially seen, there was debate as to whether this was a fungus ball or a cancer. Um, by the time that I saw him uh, another month later, he had a matching lesion in his groin growing, which I didn't put the picture in here because it's just really gross. Uh, and he unfortunately died a few weeks later from uh, his cancer.
They also have another number of other programs to help out in the area. Okay, one is they're trying to directly attack the deforestation issue with reforestation. So you can pay for your health care with seeds. This is an ironwood seed. It grows this tree that grows this densest wood in the world. Uh, if you can find some of those and bring them in, they'll accept that as payment for health care. You can also work in this reforestation project. They've got a nursery where they've got all sorts of seedlings, and then they go out and replant them in areas that have been deforested. At the same time, they're doing a number of studies to determine what's the best way to get these trees to grow back. Because one of the biggest problems is when you don't have the old growth hardwoods, lots of other things move in. And it becomes very difficult for the old growths to come back because they're very, very slow growing and they get completely overwhelmed by faster growing shrubs and, uh, and other invasive species and other trees. So they've got a number of studies going on to see, okay, what do we need to do to encourage the growth? How long do they have to grow before they can sustain themselves and that sort of thing? At the same time, they also teach animal husbandry to people. For a village, they had provided a cow. They love the cows. They do not milk the cows. They do not kill the cows. They don't even really breed the cows. The cows are extremely valuable for this. This, over a course of a couple of weeks, becomes very, very nutrient-rich compost, which they, they can then bag up and they can sell. They can sell to people for their gardens. They can sell to people so that they don't have to keep cutting down new areas to farm. And they can bring in income to a village. So the villages that have cows are really, really happy with this program. They do a number of outreach programs where they teach organic farming practices. Okay? They teach people how to do things other than slash and burn because that's all that they've ever known. They do it for both adults. And they do it for kids. Get the next generation of people, of, of farmers, doing things differently than the way that they have been taught for generations and generations. These were the kids, actually. This is our front yard right here. This is the house that we stayed in. These are uh, the neighborhood kids where they're going out and teaching, and then they're planting all of these things in our, in our house garden, which was kind of cool to see. Kids loved it. And then this is the last big project that I'm going to talk about, which I really thought was just super cool. Women in Indonesia, women in lots of developing uh, countries, don't have any means of income for themselves. If you're not married, you're pretty much destitute. You don't get trained, you don't get educated, you don't have any means to support yourself. So they came up with the Goats for Widows program. They take goats, they give them to a widow. If she's lost her husband, now all of a sudden she has a source of income. She can sell the milk, it can be made into cheese, she can sell off the young, and she can support herself on this. It's been an incredibly successful program, which then all of a sudden she has a way to not only get health care, because she's got some money, but also to get food and to get clean water and things along those lines. That's just a general overview. There are lots of other things that they're doing. There are lots of other ways to attack some of these problems, but um, this is just one example, uh, deforestation in particular, a problem, a localized area, and the things that are being done to, to work for it. Health and Harmony is the name of the, the organization, the U.S. organization. They're actually in the middle of a capital campaign. They're going to build a hospital um, that they're planning on offering full obstetrical services, which aren't available right now. Uh, they're planning on offering physical therapy. Um, they're planning on offering some surgical capabilities as well. Right now, the hospital two hours away, that's the government hospital that you have to have cash up front to pay for, also has a really, really poor reputation. And people would come from that town to our clinic to get care because the, the care that you get, even when you can get into the hospital, tends to be very poor. So this is what they're currently working on. Um, I put this down here. This wasn't in your, uh, in your syllabus. This is an article that I found just a couple of weeks ago um, that was really interesting. It's not about this area, but it's another article about the, the interplay of environmental and human health. It's in the New York Times, January 24, 2015. Meant to keep malaria out, mosquito nets are used to haul fish in. And it's talking about how African villagers who get mosquito nets to help cut down on malaria are using them as fishing nets instead, which has all sorts of interesting implications because obviously they're not working to keep, you, oh, keep malaria away from you if you're not using them as, as uh, mosquito nets. But also, lots of them are coated in permethrin, which is a potent neurotoxin if ingested. So it's leaching into the waterways and getting into their food supply and that sort of thing. So that's a really interesting article if you're interested. That's all I've got to say. Any questions? Yes, sir. Um, one thing that, that I've always wondered about is why a lot of these rural areas don't do something simple like uh, create uh, 
hothouses for human waste, uh, possibly even just to collect it to recycle, but also to keep it out of the water supply. Um, yeah, so the question, if, if, the, if you can't hear it, um, is why don't people in these places do simple things like, like build out houses to, to manage human waste, to keep it out of your water so high and keep it from contaminating things? And that's, that's actually a really, really good question. A lot of it is just because people don't know. Historically, they haven't been around and they haven't been exposed to it. And so they don't have the knowledge of A, how to do it, but be why you would do it. Outhouses, um, e even simple pit toilets, are better than nothing at all, but there are problems if you've got a village using an unlined pit toilet, it can still leach out into the soil and get into the water supply. And so doing it right can be a little bit difficult in some cases. But a lot of times it's just not having the knowledge or the resources available to do it, or not prioritizing it. If you've got somebody who they're working hard all day every day trying to just provide food for themselves, the last thing that they want to do at the end of the day, unless there's an organized effort, is go out and dig a pit latrine that, uh, that then will inevitably not be used just by them, but by other people. And it's also probably partly some of the, it's not my responsibility, it's something that everybody's having a problem with, so why should I deal with it? So there are a whole lot of contributing factors to it. But, but yeah, and it's, this is a growing area, um, latrines in general, is a growing area of concern in the, in the developing world. And there have been a lot more movements toward education of rural areas about the importance of them and movements toward how do we help people to get these resources available. Yes? How long were you in Borneo? How long were we in Borneo? For total, it was just about six weeks. We spent a month volunteering and then two weeks traveling afterward. So. Yes? I think that you've got some very interesting and, and even unique um, projects going on. Has there been any kind of an impact evaluation of the uh, projects that any of the projects or all of them put together? Because it's really, I like the way it's uh, so reinforcing too, mutually reinforcing. Yeah, and the question is whether there's been any sort of evaluation of the impact that, that these programs have had in place. Those are ongoing and in process. When we were there, they were just reaching, I think it was three years that they'd been up and running. And so they had had baseline data prior to when they started implementing these things. And they were just starting to collect follow-up data to analyze and evaluate that. I don't know what has happened since then, but that's a really interesting question. My, my sister-in-law and brother actually work for this organization part-time, both of them. Um, which is how we found out about it, and uh, I'll, I'll touch base with them, and I'll, I can email you um, if anybody's interested in, in sort of finding out what the, what the impacts are. Yes? Did you find any trickle-up effects, things that you learned there that you can apply here? Oh, absolutely. So trickle-up effects were the things that I learned over there that you can apply here. Yeah, perhaps the single biggest thing that I found is it's amazing how much you don't need. <laughs> so... <laughs> When you're, uh, when you're living in 95 plus degree heat day in and day out with, uh, with no climate control and not even solid walls and a giant nest of termites eating its way up through the floor of your room and geckos pooping on your bed, uh, it's amazing what you can do without. So, but a lot of things that, that were also were really valuable to find out is, is one, the resilience of people, which is just amazing, in that I made the comment, the offhand comment earlier about how much good a little exercise in Tylenol can do if you don't have anything else. Um, really figuring out how to make do with limited resources, particularly in a medical setting. So I had several cases of, of situations where people had had strokes. One situation, I was in a mobile clinic and, uh, and a lady had had a stroke about a year, year and a half previously, hadn't left her hut since then because she couldn't walk. And you start asking her and talking, about, talking with her about it in a little more detail, a little more specifics, and oh yeah, if she were actually standing by the window, she could pull herself up on the windowsill and could balance as long as she had something to hold on to, but she couldn't walk around on her own. And nobody had thought, 
why don't we cut her a walking stick and see if she can balance on it? And so we cut her a walking stick and she could balance on it. And she was not very well, but able to move around the house independently at that point in time. And I have every reason to believe that at some point she'd be able to get out. So figuring out how to make do with limited resources, because here you'd say, oh, well, we've got someone with a stroke who's unable to walk. Let's put him in a wheelchair. Let's get him a pair of crutches. Let's get him things like that. But those just aren't available there. And this is translated a lot into a lot of the medical care that in medical situations that I've been in, um, both in other contexts overseas, but also here in the United States. Yes? Do you know of any studies that con contrast um, the effectiveness of taking U.S. trained healthcare professionals and sending them to developing countries versus taking people that are being trained in developing countries, sending them to the U.S. and then sending them back? So yes, there are studies out there. No, I'm not familiar with a whole lot of details. There are benefits and advantages to both. The second that you're talking about to taking foreign trained physicians or medical providers from a developing country, sending them to the United States for further training and, sent, and then sending them back, works both ways. One, it tends, you tend to have a higher likelihood of them staying in that country. One of the problems that sometimes occurs with that, however, is that they come over and they get training, they go back and they realize, mm, I could make more money and I could do other things in other areas and live more comfortably. And so they may not go back to the areas that you're really trying to focus on and target, or they may not stay there if they do. However, there is a higher proportion that do, you know, and you do improve the training that way. The risks with the first sending physicians or providers trained in developed countries out to work in, in developing countries is, has problems associated with it as well because frequently what happens is you end up with sort of a medical tourism situation where you get Western doctors coming in, they bring in all of these amazing things, but it's unsustainable and it's a very temporary thing. And so people just get a taste and then it doesn't last and doesn't have any lasting impact. It's one of the nice things about this particular program that I like in that it's a local training opportunity for local physicians. They're not being sent out of the country. They're not getting the same training, no, but they are getting the experience and the exposure so that it hopefully has a growing effect on, on the surrounding and local area. Right, and there are areas that, that do that sort of thing, both within and outside of the United States. So interestingly, when I was working in, in Bush, Alaska, off the road system, they have an amazing village health aid program up there where they will take local villagers, give them a minimum of six weeks of training, and then they become a village health aide. It's not even a mid-level level of training, and they've got basically a cookbook of things that could go wrong, and they follow the instructions and check things off over the phone um, with either a, a physician assistant or a, or a physician. But they can handle a lot of what comes into the village and can also triage things so that you can send them out. There are lots of similar things going on in developing countries. There's a great book called Where There Is No Doctor, which talks about that sort of thing and how to provide appropriate level care, uh, levels of care and what you can do in a situation where there isn't appropriate training. But yeah, I agree that, that having some sort of lower level of training in an area just to provide some sort of health care is very beneficial. And a lot of the, the villages in Borneo, they do actually have some mid-level or mid-level equivalent or lower training for a health care provider in there. How effective they are and how utilized they are, I can't say because I didn't really interact with any of them. Yeah? What about using the internet uh, to access uh, uh, better trained individuals uh, to provide information to the locals that are actually doing their hands-on work? Yeah, using the internet for providing access to, to people with higher levels of training in remote areas is a fantastic idea if internet access is available. So, so, yeah, but then you have to have the power to, you could theoretically do it over a cell phone, but you have to have the power to do it through a cell phone, and you have to be able to receive the satellite signal, and you have to have consistent, consistent ability to get it. Very, very difficult to do in some of these situations. If you don't have a generator in your village, it doesn't do you any good. Yeah, so, so yeah, yeah, it's a good idea, though. I, I ask you to join me on in two ways. Uh, first, uh, to thank Darren again for his really illuminating talk. Secondly, I want to talk.
talk to you a little bit about the upcoming schedule. So next week, it's kind of, kind of a segue to what Darren was talking about today. We're going to have Dr. Mark Shaleen talk about water, sanitation, and hygiene, some of the things that were covered here tonight. And he's going to look at that from the basis of his experience in Bolivia. And Dr. Shuleen is coming to us all the way from Livingston, Montana, so he's coming the longest distance, I think, uh, to give one of the lectures in this series. I hope you all be there for that. Now, the second announcement is, um, as I think I might have uh, mentioned last week, Dr. George Vesey has been called to the CDC uh, to do some further training there, and he'll be not available the week that he was scheduled to give his lecture. But we've been able to make a switch with uh, uh, Michelle Sayre's lecture. So what appeared in your program uh, for the February 18th is now going to be February 25th. That's going to be Dr. Risi. And what was scheduled for February 25th is now going to be on February 18th. That's Michelle Sayre. So I just want to let you know about that. And thanks again for coming to see me. If you want to have follow-up uh, questions with Darren, please come forward and uh, ask him. Come, come feel this wood too, it's pretty impressive. Yeah.